Amen. Thank you, Deborah and Judy. I want to talk to you this morning about freedom, Christian freedom. And there are multiple texts that I will draw your attention to, so I hope you have your Bible in hand. We'll keep it in hand. I think we'll have most of the text on the screen, if you would prefer to uh, watch the screen. God designed us to be free. There's a fly in the ointment, and that's sin. And sin has uh, messed with the design, and uh, we're not free. And, uh, but I want to talk about Christian freedom, what it entails, what it is, and what we can do to be uh, children of God who live a life of freedom. So I want to begin in the book of Genesis chapter 2. So I hope you have your Bible and we'll look to Genesis chapter 2. And I want to look at verses 16 and 17. This is the very first conversation that God has with Adam. The first recorded conversation. The very first thing that we read about that God says to Adam is found here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. The very first words to Adam. God says this, You are free. You are free. That's the first thing that God ever said to any human being. You are free. Now, our freedom and Adam's freedom has always been limited to some degree. And uh, Adam's freedom was vast and expansive. But there are some limitations that were placed on Adam. Just one limitation. Adam was told, you're free, Adam. Do whatever you like. Eat whatever you want to do. Look at all those trees. Trees everywhere. Do you like peaches? Peach trees over here. Do you like apples? Apple trees over here. Do you like cherries? Cherry trees in the back. Trees everywhere. Delicious fruit. Eat anything you want. Eat any time you want. Eat what you want. Eat where you want. Eat that one day, this the next day, whatever you want to do. You're free to eat as you so see fit. One limitation There's only one tree in here you cannot eat from, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Be free, Adam. You're free. Eat. Enjoy. Enjoy your life. Exercise your freedom. You're created in the image of God and live as such. But what did Adam and Eve do? The one thing they were not allowed to do, they did, and that really is the fly in the ointment, as I've already said that debilitates us and robs us of our freedom. So I want you to see that first of all. Now I want you to look to the book of Galatians chapter 5. And I want you to see that in Christ Jesus, we've been liberated. Adam was created free. Sin came and robbed Adam and Eve of that freedom to some large degree. But Christ has reestablished freedom. And that's what we read about in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. An affirmation is made. A fact is stated. Christ has set us free. Do you see that? On the cross, when Christ died, He liberated us. He made us free. He set us free. He did it for a reason. Christ has set us free for freedom. He set us free that we might be free. It is for freedom. That's the purpose that Christ liberated us on the cross. Therefore, he writes, stand firm. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke. You can see uh, cattle with a heavy yoke. You can imagine that. Do not be burdened again with a yoke of slavery. Don't be burdened again. You are free in Christ. Now I invite you to turn to the book of Romans, chapter 6. And I want to point something out. And then one verse from the Psalter. And then we'll make some points of application. I want to read all these texts, say just a word about them, then 
come to the application in just a moment. So Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Very important chapter in the Bible, Romans 6. Romans 6. Don't you know? Here's something that you ought to know if you're a Christian. Don't you know this? That when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey. He's saying that every person is a slave. Now I want to say this. I don't know that I have a need to say this in this group, but this is spiritual slavery. And it's like in the world in which we live, you can hardly use the word anymore, slavery. And uh, I'm not using it in any kind of racial way. We're not in any way promoting slavery. We're simply saying that in a spiritual sense, we are all either slaves to sin or slaves to obedience. So if you look at verse 16 in Romans chapter 6, this is the point that's made. Every person is a slave. Every person, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, male or female, young or old, every single person is a slave. And there are only two masters in the world. He tells us what they are. Every person's a slave. And you can tell who your master is by asking yourself this question. Who do I obey? Who do I obey? I will obey my master. And whoever it is that I obey, that determines who my master is. Every person is a slave. There are two masters. Look at verse 16. They are identified. The first master is sin. Some people are enslaved to sin. The second master is God. He says it this way. Some people are enslaved to obedience that leads to righteousness. Sin leads to death. So think of these two masters. Everyone's a slave. Either I will obey sin or I will obey God. Think of it that way. Now look at verse 17, the next verse. The next verse. Thanks be to God. Everyone starts out as a slave to sin. That's what everyone used to be. But by virtue of conversion, by virtue of transformation of believing in Christ, of repenting of your sin, of being saved, some people are no longer slaves to sin. They are really rather set free from that and become followers of God and slaves to God. So conversion makes the difference. That's the point made in the last part of verse 17. Conversion, obeying the form of the teaching to which you were entrusted. And then verse 18 the result of conversion for a believer is freedom. Set free. You're set free from slavery to sin and you're enabled to be a slave to God. So, one more text I want to read, then I want to make two points of application. So, find this in your Old Testament in the book of Psalms. Psalm 123, right in the middle of the Bible. If you can't find it, find it. Psalm 123 is called the Psalm of the Eyes. Verse 2, The eyes of slaves look to the hand of their master, and the eyes of a maid look to the hand of her mistress. In the ancient world, slaves were everywhere. There were more slaves than there were free people. People who were enslaved watched their masters. And their master signaled things to the slave through the hands. We would know to come. We would know to stop. Hand signals. Every slave knew that he was responsible to obey his master. So when the slave came into the presence of the master... He would watch the master's hands. And the hands of the master would signal to the slave what it is that the slave should do or ought not to do. Now, having read all those texts, I want to make two points of application. 
Point number one. If you are a believer, you are no longer enslaved to sin. You have the ability in Jesus to defeat sin. Not perfectly until you get to heaven. But authentically, in a real sense, if you are a follower of Jesus and have put your faith in Him and have turned from your sins, you have within you the Holy Spirit and you have the ability to defeat sin. But I want to help you this morning because most people go about it the wrong way. And I bet most of you go about it the wrong way and I want to help you. I want you to live a more victorious Christian life. I want you to understand the basic idea in the book of Galatians. And if you can grasp this idea, this can really transform the way you live your Christian life. I want to help you. And I want you to understand something that's very liberating. And uh, improvement as a Christian is not at all about self-effort. When you hear something that you think you ought to do, the wrong thing to do as a Christian is to say to yourself, okay, that's right. I'm going to change the way I do things. I think I'll do this and this and this. This is my game plan. I know how I can defeat that sin. I'm going to do A, B, and C, and I'll start right now doing it. That's relying on your own strength, relying on your own game plan, and relying on your own effort, and it's not going to work. The way you defeat sin in the Christian life is the same way you come into the Christian life. You enter the Christian life through faith and repentance, and you defeat sin in the Christian life in the same way. There's no difference. How do I enter into the Christian life? Here's how it works. A person becomes aware of his or her sin and God's judgment against sin and my inability to please God. I become aware of those things. And I fall on my face before God and I confess my sin to God. And he goes maybe something like this. Dear Lord, I'm a vile sinner. I have broken your commandments. I've done evil rather than good. My thoughts have not been pure. My tongue has not said the things that I ought to have said. Dear Lord, I've done things I ought not to have done. And it's not just a few of these things that I've done. Many, many things I've done that I ought not to have done. I am a real sinner. And dear Lord, I can't do a thing to earn your favor. I don't have the ability within me to do what you want me to do. I'm incapacitated by my sin. I cannot change my life. But Lord, I'm calling out to you and asking you to save me. You can do for me what I cannot do for myself. So I'm looking to Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I trust in Jesus. And I am going to turn from my sins. And Lord, I'm a vile sinner. I'm going to turn from this sin, and Lord, I'm thinking of this sin, and yes, I remember this sin. I'm going to turn from that sin, Lord, and I'm going to come to Jesus. I lay my sins at the cross of Jesus. I put my hope in Him. My only confidence is in Jesus. When you do something like that, you're saved, right? That's how we're saved. We're not saved by changing ourselves through human effort it's just the opposite of that we're saved when we cry out to God and say there's not anything I can do through human effort to save myself you have to do it for me I'm trusting in Jesus and I'm turning from my sins I can't save myself that's how we're saved that's also how we defeat sin we defeat sin in the same way that we're saved. Now, when you read the Bible or when you come to church, 
When the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, you become aware of something in your life that's displeasing to God. It's sinful. Maybe you gossip. Maybe you watch things on television you ought not to watch. I'm not going to be specific. We don't all sin exactly the same way, but we all sin. Let's say that you have a particular problem that's troubling you. Maybe it's a besetting sin. And you want to move forward in your Christian life. Here's what you do. Here's what you don't do. You don't say, okay, I've got this sin. Here's my game plan. This, this, and this. That'll never work. What you do with a sin problem is the same thing you did when you were saved. You come to God. You fall on your face and you cry out to God and say, I am a sinner. I can't control the way I talk. I say things I ought not to say. And I do it before I even realize what I'm doing. Sometimes I'm malicious in what I do. Sometimes it's just habitual. Lord, I don't want to keep doing this. I need to change, but I don't have the ability to change. I don't have the strength to change. But Lord, I know what I'm doing is wrong. My speech is wrong. So I want to come before you, Lord, and confess it. This is a sin. This is a vile sin. This is a sin against God. I am a weak sinner. And this is what I do. And having announced your sin to God, then you look to the cross of Jesus And you say something like this. Even though I'm a sinner, Jesus died for my sins. And Jesus died for my sins to set me free. So I review the gospel with regard to my particular sin. And this is what happens. When you do that, God changes you from within. He alters your heart. He changes your mind. It's just like conversion. When you're saved, you cry out to God and He gives you a new heart and a new mind. And out of that, change comes because there's been a radical change within you. When you are a believer and you sin, you cry out to God again. And you look to the cross again. And you Bewail before God the fact that you are a sinner like you are. I am, you are, we are. I moan before God. I cry before God. I recognize my sin. I see it for what it is. Then I look to the cross. I ask God to forgive me. And God changes me from within And that enables me to have the power to change my behavior, you see. I can't change my behavior from without. It has to be internal. And the only one who can change me internally is God. And he does it in one way only. Through the confession and repentance of sin and through faith in the cross. That's how I'm saved, and that's how I am sanctified. That's how I live my Christian life. So whatever your sin is, whatever it is, uh, and all of us are constantly fighting sin, if you're serious about wanting to change, this is what you do. You look at that sin just as you looked at yourself before you were saved, And you cry out to God in repentance, looking to the cross, and God transforms your mind. And he softens your heart, and out of that, change comes. Do you see that? You don't change yourself from without. You change yourself from within, and only God can do that. So the only real change that will ever come is change that comes from the result of God softening your heart, 
giving you a new mind, and out of that, good behavior comes. You have to go through that process. What we tend to do is depend upon human effort. Okay, I'm not doing this right. I'm going to change. That will fail. That will forever fail. You can not change your behavior. Only God can change your behavior. And he changes it through the gospel. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. How am I saved? I repent and I believe. How am I able to defeat sin? I repent and I believe. The same exact process. How often do you repent? Well, no more than you sin. This is what we do day after day after day until Jesus comes back. What should I do tomorrow probably? Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the cross. Repent, look to Jesus. Do it over and over and over again. You're not being saved multiple times, but you're looking to the same ability to transform that initially brought you into the Christian faith in order to change your life. So, I'm freed from the slavery of sin. I'm freed from it, but not through human effort. I'm freed from the slavery of sin through the gospel. Through the gospel, I repent and I believe. One more verse I want you to see. And then we'll pray together. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. I'm saved from something, and I'm saved for something. I'm I'm saved from slavery to sin through the gospel, and I'm saved for something. Ephesians 2.10 We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. What does it mean to be free? This is a sermon about Christian freedom. What does it mean to be free? To be free, I'm freed from the slavery of sin. I've talked about that. I'm freed from that, and I'm freed for good works. So tomorrow, I can preach the gospel to myself and deal with my sin in that way, and I can look about for good works to do. God will have prepared things for me to do tomorrow that's good. I'm saved to do good works. I'm not saved by doing good works. I'm saved in order to do good works. So what good works will there be for me to do tomorrow? I don't know. But in the course of the day, I'll see this or that or one thing or another. And I will either do that good work or not. But I've been saved in order to do good works. Maybe you'll need to help a child tomorrow. Maybe you'll need to take food to someone who's hungry tomorrow. Maybe you'll need to help someone who's sick tomorrow. I don't know what the good work will be for you to do tomorrow, but there will be something for you to do tomorrow. I'm saved to do good works. Look for them every day. Okay, Lord, I'm awake now. Here I am. It's seven o'clock on Monday morning. What do you want me to do today? Well, the Lord's going to show you. Okay, there's a good work. I can do that today. That's why I'm saved. I'm saved I'm set free to do good works. I'm I'm saved from slavery to sin, and I'm saved for the doing of good works. Help me tomorrow, Lord, to find what it is that you would have me to do. Christian freedom. Christian freedom. Saved from, saved for. From, for. Saved from slavery to sin 
through the gospel, saved for good works that the Lord will bring to my attention day by day by day. And one of the great pleasures of Christian living, I get to do this good work for the Lord. I'm doing it for Him. I'm doing it to show my love to Him. I'm doing it because He saved me. Lord, thank you. I get to do good works tomorrow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I'm saved from slavery to sin through the gospel. I'm saved for good works. I've been set free. I've been set free. I'm not good at fixing things, nor am I good at building things. My worst nightmare is to get something in the mail that's not put together. I cannot put it together. I can put it together, it just doesn't function. When I put it together, I can look at it and say, that doesn't look like the picture on the box. I can't put it together. I can't design it. God designed me for freedom. But sin distorts it so that I don't look like the box. And to make myself look like the box, I have to believe the gospel every day. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. And look for good works. If you'll do that, you'll find that Christ has set you free indeed. We'll pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible. Where would we be without the revelation of God? Where would we be without Jesus, who dies for sinners like us? He's come to save us, and he's come to set us free. And Lord, so many times we think that we achieve human freedom through human effort. And Father, this just leads to failure. And we've all experienced that because we don't have what it takes to live for you. But you can transform us, Lord, and you do transform us from the inside out. And this is the way forward to preach the gospel to ourselves, to continually practice the very means by which we first became Christians in the first place, by believing in Jesus and by turning from sin. When we do this, Lord, you transform our heart and you give us a new mind. And then good behavior follows. So it's from the inside out. And Lord, I pray that we might understand that concept and not think that we can do certain things, and by doing these things, we will become better. Lord, it's through the gospel, and through the gospel alone, that we are made better. So give us eyes to see, and ears to hear, and help us, Lord, to live as you have so designed us. And we pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. Let's stand and sing. Deborah will lead us as we sing. <laughs>